Well, hello, everybody. This is Olivia Melnick again, and it's been a while since I posted a, 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 an interview. I'm excited today uh, with the two guests I'm going to introduce in a minute. But first, let me tell you a couple of changes. Uh, some of you watching might already know, but uh, and you'll see it in the description. I have actually uh, started my own ministry. The Lord is uh, leading me towards uh, spending more time in equipping Christians uh and about uh, how to fight anti-Semitism and be better advocates and and be prepared to help Jewish people uh, that way. Um, and so uh, I started the ministry, as you'll see in the description, called Shalom in Messiah. And this is my first official interview uh, for the ministry. So uh, there is a way for you to follow us in the description under the video, as well as a way for you to donate to our nonprofit tax exempt um, uh, ministry. So, if the Lord le leads you to do so, uh, you know where to find it. And uh, but I'm very excited today because I got two do two very good friends. Uh, one of them I've had him before on the show. It's John Holler. And uh, if you know him, and a lot of you do know him, all I have to do is ask him a question and <laughs> let him run with it. So, John, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for being. Thank you for having me again. And uh, the other friend, you might not know him, uh, but you should. Uh, he is a, a congregational leader of a Messianic congregation in Orange, California, uh, Congregation Ben David. And uh, he is the current le uh, congregational leader right now. He's the dear friend of mine of many years, another Jewish believer. His name is Rob Schwartz. Uh, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So, you know, I was thinking this morning when I sent the invitation, it was uh, uh, Holler, Melnick, and Schwartz. I'm thinking this could, it sounds like a law firm. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> There's the, Wall Street law firm. Yeah. There are two Jews on this call, but there really is a lawyer because, John, by trade, you are a lawyer, right? I still am a lawyer, technically. Right, right. Okay, so, uh, well, we have a lot to discuss Um, um and uh, so I don't even know where to start. Uh, every every day I look at at what's going on in in the news in the Middle East, and and it's just like uh, it's just nonstop. And I talked to you a couple of days ago, uh, John, uh, and um, I was uh, I was very concerned. I'm very concerned about what's of course what's going on in Israel with our people, with the Jewish people, and uh, and I asked you. Uh, I said, like, you know, what, what what do you know? Because you've got some contacts. We all have different contacts. But I want to start with that, John. What what do you know? Uh, what have you learned in the last couple of days about what's going on in the northern border uh, with Lebanon? Because things are very, very hot. Uh, and I want to talk, talk about that. And I want maybe uh, we can talk next about also what's happening in, um, uh, in Judea and Samaria, uh, because things are really, really uh, getting very hot in that area as well. But what do you know about Lebanon that people might not know yet? That's something that that's new. Well, I uh, I have a friend who was just up there, but he was uh, not feeling well, so I wasn't able to talk to him. Uh, his name is Simon Barrett. He does a thing called Middle East Report on Revelation TV in the UK. And he was just in Israel last week. He went down to the Gaza border. I interviewed him and then they were going up north and I was hadn't had a chance to follow up with that. But I do follow a number of um, uh, websites, blogs, uh, podcasts, that type of thing. Of course, Caroline Glick from JNS, Jonathan Tobin, who I did a panel with last week um, on Genesis 12.3 Project YouTube channel. I uh, used to be with Fox News, and there's a lot of concern about the North. I, I saw an interview with a lady named Rahit uh, Sarit Zahavi, who is the head of Alma Research. And I would highly re recommend, if you want to follow what's going on really on the ground in the North, go to Alma Research. I think it's alma-research.org is their website. Uh, they do a lot of postings because they – uh, Rahit Zarit lives in the North. She's a former IDF. Uh, and you can find interviews with her on YouTube in a number of places like the IDSF YouTube channel. And she's making the point that we have a very difficult situation up here. Uh, to the extent that we have what we have learned about Hamas and Gaza, which is probably 
the most sophisticated embedded deeply embedded terror base that anybody has ever tried to take down uh it's unique in the world but the concern is that whatever they found with the tunnels in gaza which they estimated to be maybe 180 miles of tunnels at the beginning of the war now they're saying it's above 500 500. and they're they're much more sophisticated than they thought and uh when i was in israel a year ago i they took us down to the Gaza border to one of the kibbutzim there uh, uh, and near the one we went to, which is, I think, the closest kibbutz to the Gaza fence. But they also took us to the Urban Warfare Training Center where they have a mock-up of Gaza and tunnels. And we went through the tunnels. Well, we started to go through the tunnels, and it was pretty obvious to me that, um, you know, I often joke that I'm a 2X guy in a 1X world in terms of size and the tunnel was uh medium at maybe medium to small to get. So I figured that if I went through the tunnel, they were going to have to send in, you know, a special IDF special forces team to extract me from being stuck <laughs> in there. So Simon, if you ever see Simon bear, he's much thinner. So he went through and I said, you can tell me about it, but it's a mock-up of Gaza. It has tunnels and buildings, mosque, all these things. It's a very unique training facility. But it shows it, it it really brought home to me the difficulty of urban warfare. So take what they've learned now in Gaza. Let's go back to the north, the question that you asked. The concern is that whatever Hamas has in Gaza, Hezbollah has much more of in, in southern Lebanon in terms of tunnels, yeah. sophistication of tunnels, rocket launching places. Uh, rocket launchers, it will be a much more difficult battle up there. Uh, and probably part of that is because Hezbollah has effectively taken over the control of the Lebanese government over the years. It has fairly fairly much unrestricted access to weapons, technology, money, uh, because the government really can't does not is not able to do anything to control Hezbollah. So they they've been able to do uh more than Hamas probably because Hamas, you know, in Gaza, there have been border restrictions, there's been a sea blockade and that type of thing, but still Hamas has been able to build <clears throat> this they had to spend billions of dollars on this tunnel network. It's just unbelievable. But Hezbollah has more up there. The other problem is that about 100,000 people in the north, and I know, Olivia, you've been up there. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, when Pam and I were there about, was now about seven years ago, we drove all the way. When Trump was in Jerusalem that day, we figured everything was going to be shut down. So we drove up the Jordan Valley all the way through the Golan, and then drove all the way across the Lebanon border to, um, to Nahariya, the farthest north right. town in Israel. And uh, it's a very, it's very hilly. It's, it's very similar to California coastal terrain, uh, hilly, mountainous, steep valleys, ridges. It can be very difficult to navigate in the winter if there's any snow. And of course, even, even though it's 60 degrees here in Ohio right now, uh, in the middle of February, early February, it's, it, you know, it can get very snowy up there in the mountains of Lebanon. So it's very difficult for them to go in now, but they have 100,000 people who've evacuated. They're not living in their homes. They're living in hotels to the south in Israel. <clears throat> I hear <clears throat> Kiryat Shimona, uh, which is up near Tel Dan, <clears throat> uh, the, probably the largest city up there, is about 25,000 people, and they might have 2,000 people still living in the town. And so everything is, I mean, you know, when we were there, they're, they're like Walmart type built, you know, stores right. and that type of thing up there uh, to buy in gasoline and everything. So, the, the, but it, so they, they've evacuated. They can't live. And, and Sarit said this, we cannot live with the threat of Hezbollah on the border because they'll come and they'll take hostages. They'll fire rockets at us. And it's so, not so, something so, John, so I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, you know, and not that I'm looking forward to that, but we know it's, 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 it's pending. But what is keeping Hezbollah from, from actually making a move like, like uh, Hamas did? And again, I'm not looking forward to it. 
And I don't want to get the comments on the, you know, in, in on the video, like, you know, what are you asking this question? Well, I'm just surprised they haven't done anything uh, like, like, like on October 7th. Do you think Iran is keeping him at bay? I do think that there, I mean, if you remember about a week after the October 7th, there was this big speech that Nasrallah was going to give. And so we all, we all logged on and we all watched the translation of the speech and, and it was really kind of a nothing burger, you know, Oh, well, we're going to, don't you dare do anything. Think about doing this. We're going to defeat you and that type of thing. But, and, and there has been this sort of cat and mouse game with, um, so Israel will take out his mall, his bala or Iranian revolutionary guard leader. And so like today there were 30 rockets or missiles fired from Hezbollah into Northern Israel. They attack some of the Israeli intelligence bases up there at Mount Meron, but they don't really go full bore. And I think part of the reason they don't go full bore, at least my thinking is they see the pictures coming out of Gaza. So in 2017, there was a security conference at Herzliya, um, the Herzliya Security Conference, and the head of the Israeli Air Force, and I can't remember, his, his name begins with an E, I can't remember the name, his name at the, at the moment, he gave a speech and he said, listen, you know, we know that the war in the North, that, that North is our biggest problem, this is our biggest concern, uh, they had pretty much figured, well, we can contain Hamas, which turns out to be a big, is a big, big mistake and will probably end a lot of military and political careers. But he says, in terms of Hezbollah, listen, we were involved in the Second Lebanon War in 2006 for 37 days. We accomplished our goals and then we withdrew. And there's, you know, UN Resolution 1701, which nobody enforces. Hezbollah violates it all the time. The UN forces there never enforce it. You know, they're supposed to be north of the Latani River, essentially. And they're supposed to be a buffer zone, but they, they've embedded deeply, just like Hamas, within southern Lebanon. And I think they're looking at the – Hezbollah is looking at the pictures of what the destruction coming out of Gaza and what the Israeli Air Force head at the time said, listen, if we go to war, when, when we go in, we will do more in 24 to 48 or 72 hours than we did in 37 days. It will be shock and awe like you've never seen before. And I think what they're doing in, in Gaza sort of reinforces that. And it, it seems like in the Muslim world and in, elsewhere in, in that part of the world, which is hard for us Americans to wrap our head around, is there is respect for the strong horse. So I think what you're going to find Iran doing, Iran rarely fights directly, it fights through proxies. Right. But its proxies are also practical. I mean, Israel has killed probably over half the number of Hezbollah fighters since October 7th that they killed during the entire Second Lebanon War in 37 days without formal incursions across yeah we don't even we don't even hear much about we don't even hear much about that at all there's probably a couple hundred hezbollah fighters i would estimate including some of their top leadership have been uh taken out by israel so there's this cat and mouse game and it's like very tenuous and you wonder like when is this thing really gonna break out and something's going to happen but all of the security people that i've talked to have said Without saying it, we cannot tolerate this situation, and eventually we have to do something. And it yeah. will be it will be difficult. But you know, understand, Israel is a, a country of nine million people, limited resources. Uh, they've called up what three hundred fifty thousand from the reserves. Right. Um, they're probably going to completely reconfigure their courses at their their. Uh, armed forces after this more of a permanent standing army rather than relying on reserves because it's the the fly and that thinking was demonstrated greatly with gaza so i i don't know it's 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 like nobody really wants to do that and really right now with the houthi thing in the red sea interrupting a major conduit of world shipping probably 50 15% of world shipping and maybe 20% or more of world oil goes through the Suez Canal. 
that, that's what, it doesn't really impact the United States that much, but it impacts Europe greatly. I, I just, I think people are sort of sit, sitting back and wondering, is the U.S. going to do something to get more involved in this? Are they just going to do these little one-off attacks yeah, on which is, it Iranian looks things? It, it looks that way right now. But I, I, okay, I want to stay on the, on the topic of, of, uh, of, of the war right now because, and, and I want to shift back to Gaza and, and, um, uh, and Judea and Samaria. For those, those who are listening and don't know what Judea and Samaria is, uh, it's, it's the actual name of the West Bank. It's being called the West Bank by, by the Western world or by, by the whole world, but really it is known as Judea and Samaria. And, uh, uh, John, I want, <laughs> I, I I want your opinion on something, your take on something. Uh, Rob and I were talking about, uh, you know, what's happening in Gaza and in Israel and how the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people are responding. And Rob came up with a theory that he's been kind of thinking about it for years. And uh, so, Rob, what's you and I were talking about this this morning? Share share with us what what we're talking about, and now I, I want to get uh, John's reaction. So, you know, this is a world of perception. You know, I've learned a long time ago that perception drives reality, not the other way around. And so the United States is sitting here going, we need a two-state solution. And you hear it from different, different governments. The Israelis are smart enough to know that there have been, what, five or six offers since the 30s to offer the Arabs an Arab state there. Right from the Peel Commission in 1937, you can go to the the the, the partition plan in 1947 and 48. You can go all the way through the Oslo Accords, Camp David, all of that. Um, I'm I'm amazed at the lack of understanding of history. It seems that nobody has ever understood the role of the of the League of Nations, the San Remo Conference, the British Mandate, all of that. All of that leads to this point. If it is determined and forced on Israel the creation of a Palestinian state, that becomes a separate sovereign government. And that article that we read today that you sent me, with all the issues that go with it, is it going to have a military? Is it going to have diplomatic corps? Is it going to have uh, freedom of movement, freedom of the press, all of that stuff? But something hit me a number of years ago, and that was... If there is an independent nation sitting there, the first rocket that comes over the border, the first bullet that gets fired, the first terrorist attack, does Israel now as a standing sovereign nation on its own have the right to defend its borders internationally now with a recognized sovereign nation next to it? And everybody makes the, the drops the analogy in there. If Mexico invaded Israel, which in some ways might be happening already, does yeah, at least United our president States, might actually think that's happening. <laughs> well, <I'm sorry. laughs> Does yeah. the United States have every right to defend its borders and completely smash the enemy? So I'm thinking Israel, it would almost give Israel the permission to say, you know what, we're done. And we're going to go in and we're going to completely decimate this and we're going to end it now. And that would be a radical thought. But at the same time, internationally, almost acceptable. So what do you think? You want to know what I think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a little bit of a crazy idea, but but would that would would that give Israel uh, uh, the right on an international level to defend itself better than right now? Which, of course, we know Israel has a right to defend itself because because of of what's happening. But the whole world is going. You're killing children. You're killing refugees. You're you know you're you're you you it's a humanitarian crisis. Uh, would that change things? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it was an interesting take. Well, I would say that it, I think it's a very good take, and I think that the the factor that we need to do, though, is that uh, it, it goes back to whether anybody recognizes the legitimacy of the Jewish state, which is kind of interesting with some of the discussions that are going on. Like this would, they're trying to get the Saudis to formally recognize Israel. You know, they've got the United Arab Emirates, they've got Bahrain. Um, you know, I've got Morocco. What's the other? Is it Oman? Oman. It's also Oman. Oman. Yeah. Oman. And and so I, 
you know, that, that would sort of shift the way other people are going to have to talk and think about it. If that was actually the case, so that they actually allowed the creation of a state, but I, they've already allowed the creation of a state, you know, it, they, it's trans Jordan and uh, it's trans Jordan. That's changed its borders over time. They used right. to control the quote West bank. And then in the 67 war, they gave it up. Um, but and, and so now they don't they don't want a two state solution. They want a three or four state solution is really what people are pushing. You know, whether Gaza is separate and the West Bank is separate. So you have Jordan, Gaza, West Bank and Israel. That would be four states. It's, and nobody really is honest about what that looks like. So one of the proposals from the Saudis is that started being floated about a year and a half ago through Al Arabiya, and then also through the Wall Street Journal was this um, thing called the Hashemite Kingdom of Palestine, where they would give control of these areas, Gaza, West Bank, uh, to Jordan to rule. And the Saudis, the Saudis then I think a part of that would come in and sort of take control of the Temple Mount, which is kind of interesting because one of the narratives that that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is allowing to be posted out, pushed out there is that, you know, really the Muslims don't have a, a true religious Quranic connection to the Temple Mount. That's not where it, Mohammed made his night journey. So Dr. Mordecai de Kadar has written about this quite extensively uh, from the Israeli side, and he's probably the leading Israeli uh, expert on Arab and Islamic culture in the world. And he's probably one of the leading ones, in the, certainly in the top two or three in the world. But so it's, it's just kind of an interesting convergence of all these little different things. So to Rob's point, I think that I think that it would be interesting, but it seems like the only border that nobody really wants to recognize is Israel's border. Yeah, agree. I and mean, when you when you look on international maps, uh, with the way Israel's borders are drawn. There's, it seems like there's more dotted lines around Israel than almost any other. I mean, there are border disputes all over the place. But, you know, Ethiopia, Somalia, they have a border dispute. But there seems to be a lot of dotted lines around Israel. So I don't know if, I don't know if the international community would be willing to accept that, Rob. But it would certainly unmask them for what they really are. Yeah, you know, it... Again, it's a world of perception, and we know that there really is no desire in the Arab world anywhere, or there, I should maybe expand that to the Islamic world. They don't really want a solution because the more the pot boils, I can't, I, I've been saying this for years too, you know that big pot of spaghetti sauce that you, when you have guests over, and that thing simmers all day long. This whole thing, they have a vested interest in keeping it simmering, never quite settling it, never quite fixing it, but the thing, and then once in a while, it's going to boil up. And they just, you know, the 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 Islamic world, for years, they've had a, an opportunity to take all these refugees in. They could have but, done it. If, you know, let me finish my point a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in 1948, actually going back to 1920, the original uh, British mandate included Jordan, or Transjordan as we call it, right, as part of the Jewish homeland. And then when the Arabs started kind of pushing back a little bit, Churchill, I think, got involved and pulled that back and cut back the Jewish homeland. All of that was part of the British mandate, if I remember correctly. I've got a book on my bookshelf. Um, it was published in 1938 called The Rape of Palestine. It is a phenomenal book, and it shows the original British mandate mapped. Nobody knows that history. Well, nobody talks about that history. Some people know about it, but nobody wants to talk about it. It needs and, to be out there. And the, really the, the Arab world, I mean, the the the, the Palestinian, uh, uh, whoever they are, they've been offered numerous times. Countless. When, yeah. la, when it was last time with Arafat and Ehud Barak, it was, it was what, 97%? Yeah, something like that. At least five or six offers over the years to create a Palestinian state and they've turned and, every one of them down. So, so the, the, you know, the, the, the more territory that, that Israel gives or takes, or it doesn't matter, oh. uh, you know, when, when a big, big section of the world and, and definitely a lot of the, of the Arab world and the Muslim world uh, wants to eradicate Israel, it doesn't matter how much, how much land they give. 
uh, they want them all gone. And that's that's what you get in that statement from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, that basically from border to border, there yep. will not be any Jewish person uh, and alive. It's, so, and it's written, the policies are written in the Palestinian Manifesto and the Hamas Charter. Both of those documents still exist online. You can get them. Yeah. And even the Pal even the Hamas Charter was updated, I think, like 10 years ago or something. doesn't matter. They have, st is, you know, uh, Olivier, I learned something from you years ago. When your enemy threatens your existence, believe them. It's simple. They have stated their point, and nobody seems to understand that it is. They mean it. They mean what they say. Long term goal is to wipe the Jews out and kill them. Let me let me kind of swerve down just a sort of different path on this because I've I've talked a lot about this, and I think we're living at a very significant time in prophetic history. And I think some of this is coming to the fore. Now, I personally think that these Islamic countries play a much bigger role in the end times than others do. Um, and, and, and that's okay. You know, it, it's one of these things where these things sort of develop gradually over time. And then they, they suddenly seem to burst on the scene fully formed. And this is the way prophecy seems to work. So I'm not, I'm not dogmatic about it. But I heard a very interesting podcast, a series of podcasts by a guy named uh, a guy named Dan Sinor, who was, I believe, worked in the security, national security and the Trump administration, Jewish guy. It's the podcast name. You can get it on Apple. It's called Call Me Back. And he has a weekly interview with a guy who I think is probably I'm not sure where he stands politically. I'm pretty sure he does not like Bibi Netanyahu. OK, um, and that's okay. I mean, you, you can, you, and you know, I, I go back and forth on it myself. Uh, and I have a lot of friends in Israel and they really detest Netanyahu. And so this, this may be the end of Netanyahu, but a lot of people have written his political obituary and been proven wrong over the last 25 years. Uh, but I interviews a guy from times of Israel writes there, his name is, uh, Raviv. Haviv Redig Gur, G U R. And he, he's on this Call Me Back podcast every week. And he, they did a thing on the 100 days of the three parts. And the second part of the review of the war from 100 days was very, very interesting. And, and I think Mr. Gur is a historian, analyst. And again, I'm not sure I agree with his politics or anything. I think he's, I think he's orthodox, but you know, not ultra orthodox, but he made the point was, listen, this is a war for the soul and narrative of Islam. Mm. And what you're seeing develop, which I think is very significant prophetically from Daniel chapter 11, where they talk about the King of the North, King of the South. Mm -hmm. And we always, and everybody's got their idea, you know, it's going to be this, this, I'm just saying, this is just another thing to throw into the pot to consider but what you're seeing is that that there's been significant change in the Saudi Sunni uh, worldview as Mohammed bin Salman has risen. Now, personally, I don't trust all these guys. That's that's one thing. But that they are they're trying to modernize. They've shut down their Wahhabi madrasas all over the world. Uh, so they are trying, and and what what they're doing is tell tell, tell our audience what what a, a madrasa is. They might not it's, know it's it's a Islamic seminary. Okay, thank you. Roughly, a school where they they learn the Quran. Right, right. And so what you're seeing though within this part of the the Sunni Arab world is that they they've been indoctrinated with this narrative that. Uh, we've got to get rid of the Jews because the Jews are bad for our existence. But now they're taking a more pragmatic approach in that part of the world. They want to normalize things with Israel because they are afraid of Iran. The, they're afraid of Shia, Iran, and Turkey, Sunni Turkey. And so there's there's a, a shift, and it's, it's sort of a change in the narrative. But in the other, the Iranian Shia and the Sunni Shia and the Hamas and Hezbollah versions of Islam, what they see is that the existence of Israel is damaged the view of their God. 
it has shown that Allah is weak in some way. How could these Jews come back from all over the world, poor, destitute, and build this incredible country in the Middle East? Now, we know that there's, we think that we're sure that God is behind it, but they look at it and say, we've got to destroy Israel for our God to be back in his place. But the Sunni Arab South seems to be making Resol- resolving that in their minds is a very interesting theory. And uh, I do think we see it playing out, it, but I do think then it plays into this King of the North, King of the South thing that we see in Daniel chapter 11. At least it's one of the ways to explain it. And, and understand too, when we talk about Bible prophecy, a point I like to make is, look, I mean, we all have our theories, okay? And how Lindsay wrote, what's that been, 55 years now that late great planet Earth has been out there. And, you know, everybody has their theories, but the world's changed. Mm-hmm. And so in the prophetic scriptures will unfold in, a, in an existing world. So it, it may be a little bit different than when we wrote our books 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so we need to, uh, I, I guess they need to be in, in the law books. You have all these law summaries and statutes and everything, and they come in a, a loosely format so that you can put in the pages that uh, the, uh, the statutes and interpretations that the courts have. So you'll get, if you're doing that as a young law clerk, you always do that. You, you'll get these, the stack of these papers like this, and, and you have to go and open these books up and put, take out the old and put in the new because the things have changed. So, I, and I'm not saying scripture has changed, but the world has, that's the, that's the point. Yeah, no, that's true. And, and, it, and we all, I mean, I, I know for a fact, there's the three of us in this, in this uh, program right now, we all have different views, uh, slightly different views on the end times, uh, but that does not take away the uh, the truth uh, of the word of God uh, and the un- unmutable word of God and the fact that we all agree that on, on those things we can agree to disagree, but on the gospel and the fact that Yeshua, Jesus came for all and that people can you know trust him for their life and for, for, for eternal life. Uh, that's the same for everybody. That's the same for for Gentiles. That's the same for Jews. Same for Muslims. Right. It doesn't matter where you are, where you're coming from. The only way to God is through the death and resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah. So we you all know, and Olivier. And to that point, what's really interesting is when somebody that's a former Muslim comes to faith, and they begin to see the Scripture and really understand the Hebraic Jewish nature of it. Uh, for example, one for Israel's Bible school up there in the north. I can't remember what town it's in. Netanya. Netanya. They've got Arab pastors on staff that are lockstep with the Jewish pastors or the those that are being trained, Jewish believers and the Arab believers, and they're one one heart, one mind. And you know, John, speaking to your point, um, there is an entire eschatology within Islam that sure. uh, is largely unknown in the West. Right. So, That's right. Part of this Sunni Shiite uh, going back and forth, they got they hate each other as much as they hate the Jews. Go figure. So I I, I have another another question for you, John. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to UNRWA? Well, they're being <laughs> they're being unfunded by a lot of people. They have a major problem, and it should show everybody the absolute total corruption and evil anti-semitic anti-jewish nature of the un i mean look we've known this for years i mean you every year uh, halal noor from un watch comes out with his list of all the uh resolutions that were adopted against a you know a country in a year and you might get two in a good year you might get two against iran and you'll always have 15 to 20 against Israel every yeah. year yeah. from all these different UN agencies. So I think that's being exposed. I, I guess the one thing that I'm concerned about as I monitor my Twitter feed is the just absolute uncontrolled Jew hatred that's out there. It yeah. is it is a sewer on my Twitter feed. It, it angers me. 
It upsets me. It concerns me. And I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's hard to deal with. And unfortunately, what you're sort of seeing is you're seeing this come from the extreme left and the extreme right. They, I think they, my view of extremes and pol- politics is that it's, it's not a linear line. It's a horseshoe. And the extreme ends kind of meet and overlap at some point. And I think that Israel is one of those places where they do that. Yeah. It, it, I agree with you, John. The only the only agreement the left and the right have is focused on Israel and the Jewish people. Well, for all that matter, the only agreement that the uh, the, the the left and radical Islam have they would they would kill each other on every uh, on every on everything yep. uh, ideologically. But when it comes to going after Israel, they can find a way to work together, which yeah, is there's, to there's, me, there's is so ground. irrational. Yeah, there's common ground. It does, yeah, you're right. It's not rational at all. So, Olivia, I, I recommended to you a, a pod, another podcast. I hate to do this because people send me stuff all the time, and it's like two hours long, and uh, so I, I just don't have that kind of time. But there was a there's a guy named Francisco Gill White who was on tenure track at University of Pennsylvania and wrote the truth about Hamas and Islam and Israel. And I, I, I mean, he's not Jewish. I don't even know if he's Christian, but he just says, listen, this Israel thing is like – this is sort of the pivot point of whether the West is going to survive. Yeah. Uh, because if they, if they go after, if they get Israel, they'll come, they're coming after us. And he made the point. So it, it, it's called through conversations. Um, and it's titled shocking revelation on the Israeli Palestinian war. It's a few months old now, but he very, very well done, very historical about the Islam and the development of Islam and the connection between the, um, uh, eugenics movement in the United States and what eventually became the pogroms in Europe. A very unassailable connection as far as I'm concerned. That's the one I haven't watched it. That's the one you said I was I was supposed to watch at 1.5 speed. Yeah, you can watch it at 1.5 speed and pay attention. I think it's well worth listening. I mean, it's... So, so uh, I, I listened to him at 1.5 speed, but I listened to Ben Shapiro at half the speed. Yeah, whatever you need to do. I mean, I, I you just have to sort of train yourself to. Uh, that's like my pot. I, my updates are not that long. You just got to play them at the right speed. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, you, but, you send that to me. You, I I haven't. I I have to watch it because. Uh, uh, but the thing is, you know, we we get a lot of information, and you know, uh, but coming, right. you know, I, I have a friend. He's with the Lord now. His name was Barry Leventhal, a Jewish believer. Oh, sure. And uh, Barry, whenever I would call Barry, uh, conversation being two minutes or half an hour, I would always hang up the phone and have three more books to read. That was Barry. Yeah. And so when I talk to you, John, every single time I finish a conversation being online or being a private conversation, and I have six more articles to read and 15 more videos to watch. Yeah, I, I try to I try to limit it, but so people can they can choose to not do it or not. But I just think that uh, the understanding that Gil White got fired from a tenure track professorship at the University of Pennsylvania, which has been in the news with regard to anti Semitism on campus, I think is significant. And uh, I, so, I yeah, you go yeah, go ahead, finish. It speaks it speaks well of his character that he was willing to speak the truth and. So this is uh, this is kind of the core issue of the time. So we'll disagree on certain aspects of end times, but I think we agree that the centrality of Israel. This is this is sort of you know premillennialism and Israel. These are kind of dividing lines for me, uh, just because I, I just don't see how these, these scenarios that are set forth in Ezekiel 36, 5, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. I just don't see how that. Matthew chapter 24, I don't see how it comes about unless there's a Jewish state here in the end times. Mm-hmm. And so here we have it. Doesn't mean they're perfect on everything, but no, they're not. No, but you're right. We have to, we need a Jewish state. So that's, you know, 1948, uh, May, May 14, 1948 was not, uh, I, I, I don't see it prophesied anywhere in the Bible. And I don't believe that there's, the, I believe that the, uh, the scripture that, sh- that says, how can a, how can a, a state nation 
a nation be born in one day. I believe that something is going to take place at the end of the tribulation. I don't believe this is referring to Israel in 1948. Uh, I see. I see that as a prophecy, sort of in process, but the ultimate. And that's interesting the way these prophecies are in Ezekiel. Like, there's all the stuff that it talks about. And everybody says, oh, well, that's been fulfilled. Well, wait, at the end it says, and then they will know that I am the Lord. So we're not at that point yet. And we're so not. you've got to so they, they, fill yeah, in so, that gap. So, but, but this being said, uh, um, uh, the, um, the, the rebirth of, of Israel as a modern nation in 1948 uh, it's a miracle, uh, you know, the way it happened. And, you know, if you look at history, but it's, it, it's not, it's not spoken of prophetically in the Bible, but it is the absolute prerequisite for what happens today. It couldn't, all the things that are lining up today could not happen if we didn't have a modern state of Israel. Uh, you know, we have the, uh, you know, the, I think, you know, I've, I've said this before uh, in, in, in many of my programs, that the one prophecy that we can take to the bank right now, and everybody, regardless of their view on the rapture, the tribulation, everybody would agree that right now, uh, Ezekiel 36, the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel in unbelief, unbelief. That's is, right. is happening right now. That's, you know, before the, the Valley of Dry Bones, which is down the road, you know, when the Jewish people are being, you know, regenerated, you know, physically and then spiritually. Uh, but right now, and it's been going on for a while, the Jews are going back to the land in unbelief. It's, it's, we, we see it every day. And, anti-semitism global anti-semitism plays a part in that because i mean i go back to the country i'm from in france right now there's a big big surge of of uh, of people jewish people making aliyah again last time we had a surge like this was after january uh 11th 19 um 2015 if you remember that was the uh, uh i can't believe it's like nine years ago my goodness yeah. Um, the, Been that long, uh, the, my goodness. The kosher supermarket attack, which yeah. was right next to my house that I used to, uh, to, to my parents' house within like a couple hundred yards. I used to go to that store. And so that was nine years ago. After that, my family, my own family, they all did their papers for Aliyah. They're going back to, they're all talking about going back to Israel. So, you know, and there's again, because of what's happening after October 7th, a big surge of, of people, Jewish people going, uh, making preparations to uh to make Aliyah uh, in, uh, uh, in because of anti-Semitism, which is, you know, the philosophical uh, question is God. God is not the creator of of, of anti-Semitism. Satan is because Satan knows that he wants to get rid of the Jews or he's going to lose his job and he doesn't want to have to retire because he knows <laughs> where he goes. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, God is allowing that to happen. Uh, do you guys, Rob? I want your opinion on this. Is God allowing anti-Semitism to happen so that the Jews will be maybe will get a little kick in the tuchas yeah. in the autumn to go you know, back that's to a, land? Olivier, that might be the question that every one of us, especially a person of Jewish background who is not saved, does not know the Lord. And I do you remember after the was the 2014 or 2015 Gaza War, the Atlantic Monthly or Atlantic as it was called, Jeffrey Goldberg. Remember the article I sent you? And one of the quotes, it was a great quote. I don't know if you heard this, John, but the writer said that in Europe, and this is 2015, again, nine, 10 years ago, that the, the inoculation of the Holocaust has worn off of Europe. And I thought that was one of the greatest quotes because it just said it all. And what's happened is the inoculation has now, the, the, the wearing off the inoculation has now moved west to the United States. We're seeing anti-Semitism in ways we've never seen it in the United States. So in answer to your question, Olivia, yeah, I think God allows this just like he's allowed it throughout history. You know, do you remember one of the, you know, the, it was a kibbutz Berry, I think, Be'eri in, um, in southern um, Israel. They put a, it was the most liberal, the most woke community in the country. They were working with the Palestinians. They took care of them, right? And somebody put a banner up after the disaster that happened that day on the 7th of October. And in Hebrew, I, the translation was, remember what Amalek did to you. And I thought to myself, when the woke left starts quoting the scriptures, you know that something's going on. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend, messaging with a friend in Israel before we started. And he has wrestled with this too. He lives in a fraught. And, um, you know, he says, I look out my my window and a hundred yards away is a fence and a mosque. Yeah. 
And it's like, are we, that's, that's a big question in Israel and politics right now. Are we going to let the Arabs come back and work here? I mean, they've relied on them. They were the ones, they were the ones that provided the intelligence to Hamas. They finally figured that one out. You know, and it's something else too. I'm hearing stories more and more. It came up on one of Caroline Glick's, um, podcast and i read it in an epic times article literally about two or three weeks after the event and this one woman said you know what i went to bed on october 6th left of center on the political scale i woke up the next day as a conservative and even barry weiss the former new york times writer who has now done she's and she's a liberal she's a lesbian jewish woman is also coming out and I saw a podcast that she was being interviewed for. And she said, yeah, we're all moving from the left to the middle. And you know, with that movement, they're beginning to see things as we've seen them all these years and they're moving to the right. And it's, and we're sitting here going, welcome home. This is what we've been telling you for years. You just didn't see it. So yes, Aunt Olivier, God has always provided a moment in time where he'll let the enemy do what he needs to do in order to make the point, to drive the point home to his own people. Well, it's it, we've seen it in the Bible many times where yeah. God is yep. using uh, the enemies of Israel to get Israel moving. Uh, but then what you also see is that God will come back and punish those who punish Israel. Yep. Uh, so, uh, but so we are, you know, when they enjoy it a little too much. What? When they enjoy it a little too much. Right. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, Anyway, so listen, uh, let us let me look at the time. Yeah, we, we, we need to wrap this up, uh, probably. Uh, um, John, any final thoughts? And then I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, about how people can find you. But any final thoughts on what's going on and what what is your biggest concern today, right now? What is really what concerns you the most? Look, I think the, the urban warfare that Israel's facing right now in Gaza is uh, in some respects unprecedented with, you know, but it appears to be over 500 miles of tunnel. It's very difficult going for them right now. I think the world is on the, we have a big problem in the world with uh, critical thinking. And I see a lot of propaganda flying around out there right now. And I see a lot, even Christians buying into it without saying, well, is that really, is that really the way it is? Is that really correct? Do I need to look at, into that a little bit further? Do I need to think about that a little bit? So I'm, I'm concerned about that because I, I think it impacts people within the church too. And remember in Matthew 24, the thing that Jesus warned most about as we would approach these times was deception. Take heed yep. that no man deceive you. Many false Christs and messiahs will come. So I think we need to be very, very careful and vigilant. And I, th I think we need to be able to talk about um, different views on how this eschatology plays out. You know, So I had a good conversation last night or watched a conversation with some friends last night. And I don't think any of them agreed with anybody about anything, but it was a good, healthy conversation. So, um but I think we're entering a time that's, it's, you know, we're, I just think that the, um, it's going to be some difficult times coming up. I, I just don't see how that does not yeah, uh, and, happen at you know, this point. Well, you know, people that might have different views on pre-trib -ra pre rapture or mid-trib or whatever, we all know that, uh, we all know that we are now, you, I agree with you, uh, John, uh, we we are entering in some difficult times, and uh, I mean personally, for me, uh, you know, I, I'm 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 pre trip pre mill, but I tell people all the time the fact that my on on my theolog theological calendar uh, or eschatological calendar for me, I understand the next event being the rapture. That's my view based on what I understand from Scripture, and we all have different views. That's okay, but the fact that I see that does not mean. And I, I, I kind of try to wake people up on that. It doesn't mean that it's not going to get a lot worse, even if the next event is the rapture. And it could be another, you know, two, three, five, ten years before that. All, all we're seeing right now, the way things are converging, I don't see us going back to 
much of the way it was before. I just see it maybe slowing down a little bit and picking up a little more craziness, slowing down like plateau and a little more, but I don't see any reversal of the way the world's events are going. I don't see it. Well, I, in my updates, like the first or second or third one of the year, the last few years, what I've been doing is, you know, how how far are we going to get into this year before we long for the good old days of last year, <laughs> which were which really weren't all that great, and you know that 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 time frame keeps seems to be compressing each year. Oh boy, if we could just go back to twenty twenty, the good old days of twenty twenty. Yeah, these are the good old days, right? Yes, I I'm I I long for the years of COVID. Yes, no, right? yeah. <laughs> it was a simpler time. Well, and we were uh, just merely locked down by our by our superiors. Right. Uh, I want to I want to let people know how they can find you. But first, I want to tell you, if you're watching this, I just want to encourage you to consider. We, we're talking about this, uh, you know, John, Rob, and I. And if you're watching this, uh, this might be the first time you watch us. We are talking about all those topics. It's crazy, it's concerning, it's upsetting, but what keeps us going is the fact that all three of us have a personal relationship with the God of the universe through his son, Yeshua, and we have this thing we call salvation. We are part of God's family, and no matter how th uh, bad things get or how crazy things get, we know that our place is secure, and we have put our trust in the death and resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, the uh, Savior of the world. So that is something that anybody can do just by believing that you need this person, Yeshua, God in the flesh, as a redeemer. So I, I invite you to do that even today if this is something that you have never done, because then we can continue the conversation, but your place in the family of God is secure. So don't don't wait another day. Now, um, uh, uh, Rob, you lead the congregation. Tell us if people are in Southern California, tell us where and tell us how they can connect with you online. Okay, we have a, our Messianic congregation is in Orange, California. We meet on Saturday mornings at 1030 each week. Uh, and you can find us at Ben David, Messianic Jewish Congregation online. So if you want to come visit us, we'd love to have you. Uh, you'll get the gospel. You'll get Jewish history. And right now we're studying the book of Zechariah. So we're, we're teaching uh, uh, prophecy from a biblical Jewish perspective. So if they come visit your congregation and they come shake your hand, uh, Rob, will they get a bagel? Absolutely. Bagel time starts at a quarter to 10, along with coffee. Very good. Thank you. John, I should say where I am. Yeah, I'm at uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel in Sunbury, Ohio. We have a YouTube, either my name or Fellowship Bible Chapel. And uh, we're also on Rumble at Real FBC. Uh, the website is fbchapel.com. And we are in the process. We're getting very close to rolling out an audio version podcast on a number of different platforms like Spotify, Apple, and that type of thing. I hope to have gotten that done this week, but I've been doing a lot of interviews and reading. So uh, maybe next week I'll get to it or the week after. But we're very, very close to doing that. We're, we're making progress on that end. And I will put all the uh, information for both of you guys in the description uh, under the video uh, once I post it. Uh, guys, I want to thank you. John, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Oh, I had you. about another three or four questions uh, to ask you. Uh, I'm going to table them and we'll have another show real soon. Uh, I know I'm coming to your church in the spring. We're going to do a oh, that's right. that's over and we do an update, uh, prophecy update. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, April maybe 20th and 21st, if people need the dates. When? I think it's April 20th. We're going to do a Seder. Yeah. on Saturday, and then April 21st, you'll be there on Sunday. Right. So, uh, guys, thank you very much. And uh, for you people watching, remember, this is the first video interview uh, under my new ministry banner, Shalom in Messiah. Information in the, uh, in, in the, uh, under the video uh, on how you can uh, reach us, you can reach out to me, ask questions, support our ministry, and pray for us. Until next time, Shalom and be blessed.